go ahead and get started. So yeah, for all of you who are new here, my name is Dan from Dan's Test Prep. This is a weekly segment called Tutor Tuesday, where we go over SAT style questions to help you prepare for the tests. So what we'll do today is kind of what we've been doing with uh, we'll start by any requests that you guys have any topics we can pull up those kind of questions and just go through that the hardest DSAT math problem on module 2 well I can't share any uh, problems from the test well not that I have them at all anyways but we can pull up some pretty hard DSAT problems that I've come across during uh, my prep, my tutoring, and all that sort of stuff. I think this one is a pretty tough one. Yeah, I'd basically just do SAT and ACT tutoring. Sometimes people submit other questions, but it's mostly SAT and ACT style qu tutoring questions. So we've got, uh, let's do this question first. It should be somewhat of a, a little bit of a challenging DSAT math problem. If I can get this uh, pen working. So it says here, two identical rectangular prisms, each have a height of 90 centimeters. The base of each prism is a square, and a surface area of, of each prism is k centimeters squared. So I might just want to draw this out real quick. So it's going to look something like this. The height is 90 centimeters. And the surface area is k centimeters squared. The surface area, OK, if the prisms are glued together along a square base, so I'm taking another prism that I have here, and I'm gluing them together along the square base. So this goes here. The resulting prism has a surface area of 92 over 47 k centimeters squared. Surface area of 2 is going to be 92 over 47 k centimeters squared which means that the surface area actually got reduced. So I could start labeling, labeling some stuff here. Like I could label the side length here as x and x, such that the area of one of the bases is going to be x squared, one of the square bases. If we add the two prisms together originally, we're going to get k plus k, which is 2k. But if we combine those prisms, remember that we're combining, we're taking out of these, we're taking out these faces from our equation. So we can subtract off a 2x squared. In total, the, the total combined surface area is going to be that 2k from combining the two prisms minus the 2x squared, you know, subtracting off the two square faces. And we know that that's also equal to 92 over 47k, because that's what they told us from the problem. So this left side we derived, the right side they told us. And now we can actually solve this equation. So. What we'll do here is we'll subtract off that 92 over 47k. That'll give us, uh, let me, well, let's leave it like this. Uh, 2k minus 92 over 47k uh, minus 2x squared equals 0. Well, we can get this 2k into a common denominator of 94 over 47k and subtract that from the 92 over 47k, and then we can set that equal to 2x squared. So really, 2 over 47k is equal to 2x squared, or 
k over 47 is equal to x squared. So we get that k is equal to 47x squared. We got some answers already. So k is 47x squared. Um, we know now we can start to plug some more stuff in. Uh, the surface area can also be expressed as so the surface area of one of the prisms can be expressed as that uh, 90 times x 90 times x because we have a height of 90 and we have uh, edge length of x uh, times 4, 4, so 4 times 90 times x plus we have to add the 2x squared, those square faces. So this is, let me label this, this is the rectangular and this is the square faces. Are we all following so far? And that surface area is equal to k. We also know what k is equal to, that's 47x squared. So we can just combine all this stuff to get 360x plus 2x squared uh, is equal to 47x squared. From here, we don't even need a calculator. We just do 360x is equal to 45x squared. And if we divide by x, so assuming the answer is not x equals 0, which wouldn't make sense, we can divide by x and divide by 45. And that'll give us, uh, or let me just do this step by step. So 360 equals 45x. And divide by 45 to get x equals to 8. That gives us answer choice B. Nice. So not too bad, but you kind of do have to think a little bit outside the box or just put together all those different equations until you can solve for k and solve for x and get your side length of 8. No, this is a this is a DSAT practice test. I'm not sure if this showed up on the test, but um, let's look for some more difficult math questions. Any other topics you guys want to see? Let me know. Actually, I want to try out this one. This seems like something that might show up in math module two. It says a circle in the xy plane has its center at negative 5, 2 and a radius of 9. In equations of the circle is given. a, b, and c are constant. What's well, the value of c? So minus 81 is a good guess, but we have to consider also that when we expand the uh, circle equation, we're going to have some extra const constants thrown in there. And this is equal to 0, so we've consolidated all the constants under c. So let's just write the general or I guess a standard form of a circle equation first. Next, let's fill in our information. So we have our equation becomes x plus 5 squared, y minus 2 squared equals r squared, or I guess 9 squared. So we get x squared plus 10x plus 25 plus y squared minus 4y plus 4 equals 81. Uh, now we have to get this in the form where it's equal to 0. That's what the question was asking us. So I'm going to do minus 81 here. 
And I'm also going to consider that I have a plus 4 and plus 25 here. So I'm going to minus 81 on both sides. And I end up with x squared plus y squared. We'll combine those. I'll have the question this is telling us plus 10x plus uh, or minus 4y. And then we have to subtract 81, add 25 and 4. So 29 minus 81. Uh, what's 81 minus 29? That's 52. So we got minus 52 equals to 0. So yeah, C has to be equal to uh, negative 52. And now on the digital SAT, we can grid in negative answers. OK. What else have we got? Let's see if there's any more hard. So this is all like geometry and trigonometry circles type problems. Um, there tends to be some difficult ones with, like, let me show you guys this one. So this one is under lines, angles, and triangles. Let me put in a picture in a chat. The area, it's a little bit tricky. So don't go too hastily. The area of triangle ABC is at least 48, but no more than 60. If y is an integer, what is one possible value of x? Well. Uh, let's solve this step by step. So y is an integer. Well, I know that the area is at least 48, but no more than 60. The area is equal to 1 half base times height, which is 1 half times 12 times y, which tells us that uh, it has to be at least 48, but no more than 60. And if y is an integer, y could equal 8 9 or 10. I'm just going to, I guess let's pick y equals 10 because it uh, seems the easiest. So the, the value of y is 10, assuming we're picking this one for simplicity. If we look at the ratio here from x to y, that's the same ratio as 5 to the entire length of this triangle. It's like 5 to 12. Right? This is a small side of the smaller triangle, and this is the full side of the longer triangle. So it could be comparable to taking like this side corresponds to this side. Same, same thing as saying 5 corresponds to 12. Basically, the uh, larger and smaller triangles are in a ratio of 5 to 12. The ratio of x to y, or x over y, is equal to 5 over 12. Then if we know y is equal to 10, we can substitute that in there. So, so we get something like x over 10 is equal to 5 over 12. We can multiply that by 10 to get x is equal to 50 over 12, which we should probably, I mean, I would probably simplify this down to 25 over 6. So that's one of the possible answers. x could be 25 over 6. If we solve it out with y equal to 8 or 9, we can get the other answers. The other answer should be, if we want, we could just do them out. Like
like x is equal to 9 times 5 over 12, which would be 45 over 12, which simplifies. If we divide everything by 3, that simplifies to uh, 15 over 4. And we can also get x is equal to 8 times 5 over 12, which that's 40 over 12. Divide everything by 4 to get 10 over 3. So those are the possible answer choices. There's three possible choices because there's three possible values for y. Um, on the digital SAT, you want to express your answer as a you want to express your answer as a decimal or fraction. Since only y has to be an integer, not x. What other topics can we do? Graphing. That's a good one. That would be under our advanced math, I think. Well, it could be any. There could be any. They could be under algebra. There are some graphing problems. There are some nonlinear graphing problems that I've done before, but we can go over some of those. Or let me try to find some new ones. Trigonometry, okay. Let's do some graphing. Let's do some trigonometry. I'll show you the different types of graphing problems you might have. The first, where you don't actually need to do any graphing, is this kind of like function interpretations question. It'll tell you, you know, interpret the graph, but you don't need to graph it at all. Um, like this function here, it's modeling number of advertisements a company sent to its clients each year. X is the number of years. X is the number of years since 1997. And the Y or F is the number of advertisements. So the interpretation of the y-intercept. Well, y-intercept, you should know y-intercept is always when x is equal to 0. That's kind of like your initial value. Initial value. What I see is that when x is equal to 0, this multiplication term, 0.66, goes away. So it's just 9,000. We're left with 9,000. So if x is 0, x is 0 years since 1997, so we're in the year 1997, it's probably the number of advertisements equals to 9,000. Now it looks exactly like it matches with the answer choice D. Now a question where you may have to graph some things. Let me take a look here. Mm. OK, well, let's do a function where you can graph something. This one's asking us for the uh, y-intercept. y-intercept of the graph. To get the y-intercept, you can definitely plug it into Desmos. You could also just plug, remember, y-intercept means x equals 0. So I can plug x equals 0 in here, and I'll get f of 0 equals negative 8 times 2 to the power 0 plus 22. That's negative 8 times, or negative 8 times 1 plus 22. So that's 22 minus 8, which is negative 14. Uh, sorry, positive 14. So that's answer choice A. Yeah, it's uh, 
this, let me send it, this problem right here. You can also plug it into Desmos for sure, but uh, you don't need to. Let me show you an example where you, it would probably be preferable to graph it. It's going to be my next question. This one, now not a lot of people may know the trick for this one, so you might elect to graph it. We have a quadratic function. We have the function intersects the x-axis at the points 0, 0 and t, 0. Uh, if you know the vertex form, you can approximately graph this. Uh, you know it passes through uh, 4, negative 32. And it's going to do something like that. Yeah. You, you can get this kind of picture from Desmos, and you'd see that the points where it crosses the axis are at 0, 0, and it should be 8, 0, because if the vertex is given as x equals 4, you know it's going to be symmetrical about that vertex. So you can, you can see that the 1, 0 is 4 units away from the axis. The other zero should also be four units away from the axis. So it should be t equals to eight, looking at that point. Yeah, you can definitely graph it out. And if you don't have the knowledge of like how the graph should look like and how to graph it by hand, Desmos is a super useful tool Vertex form should be algebra 1, maybe, maybe algebra 2. Is this event? Yeah, we do every week, Tutor Tuesday. And let me, okay, let me look at this next problem that looks pretty tough. which is maybe somewhat related to graphing, but it's definitely like a nonlinear functions problem that looks hard at, at first glance. So it's got a function f defined by f of x equals negative a to the power of x plus b, a and b are constants. In the xy plane, the graph of y equals f of x minus 12 has a y-intercept at negative or 0, comma, negative 75 over 7. The product of a and b is 320 over 7. What is the value of a? Like this might be a good example of where we can use Desmos. And I'll try to plot it out here. So something like I you can I'm not sure if I'm sharing my Desmos actually let me reshare it for you guys so we have negative a to the power x plus b you can add sliders in Desmos that signify these numbers uh, the graph of y equals f of x minus 12 has an intercept at negative 0 comma negative 75 over 7. So I'm going to put that point there as well. The product of a and b is 320 over 7. 320 over 7 is approximately 45. So if you have really no idea at all, you can just kind of play with these numbers. It looks like I need to make b pretty large. 
and or maybe I guess the combination of A and B pretty large but it looks like I made B too large so we can bring it down oh and also we know that uh, the B term so the B term is really the only thing affecting the intercept the A term is our growth rate so if I want the intercept to be down here at negative 75 over 7 then this term is going to be equal to b minus 12. b minus 12 equals to negative 75 over 7. So b is equal to this plus 12. And we can convert this if we want. Like 12 is equal to 84 over 7. So really, b is equal to. Uh, what's 84 minus 75? 9 over 7. b is equal to 9 over 7. No, did I get that right? I must have missed something. So, b minus 12 is equal to this. So we'll add plus 12. Sorry guys, I might cut out. But we need to add a plus one to this b value to make it pass through that point. Because remember, when you set x to zero, anything to the power of zero becomes one. And this negative sign will turn that negative. So we have to offset b by plus one. So really, b is equal to uh, 16 over 17. And then to make that equal to 320 over 7, a should be equal to 320 over 16, which so a is 20. So let's set that a equals to 20. And it looks like a b definitely matches 320 over 7. We can check the values here. And the b value also is such that the f of x minus 12 passes through that point down here. So a little bit confusing, but let me paste that into, uh, so we'll paste this graph into the tab here on the whiteboard. And we'll show that a has to be equal to 20. That would be my preferred method of solving it. Although what we did there was kind of just use Desmos to aid in the actual algebra that goes behind it. You still had to solve for the values of b and the values of a. And that's what they're trying to do with these SAT problems. You can use Desmos, but it's really not going to give the, the answer if you don't know how to actually solve it. Something along those lines. Yeah, I'm sure I could do the SAT without a calculator. I'm not sure about the timing of it or the score that would get, but I don't think too many of the numbers are too difficult, especially with the um, they took out that section four, which usually had pretty large numbers that would take take a long time to comp compute. Let's do this next one. See, we've got some answers already. Let's check. The function f is defined by fx equals a to the power x plus b. a and b are constants. The graph of y of equals f of x has an x-intercept at 2, comma, 0, and a y-intercept at 0, comma, negative 323. Yeah, I guess similar thing. We want to look at the y-intercept, because that is determined by the b value. f of 0, as we're given here, is equal to a to the power of 0 plus b 
which is negative 323. That's 1 plus b equals negative 323. And b equals just that minus 1, so negative 324. So that's one where, if you wanted to, you can plot it in Desmos, but it's quicker to just do it by hand. Are test scores or grades more important? Uh, I think Mahata and Gohar answered that one pretty well. But I think they all sort of count towards your application. Unless you're applying somewhere that's test optional or test blind, then, of course, grades are going to matter the most. But also your personal statements and your essays and your extracurriculars all tie into it. So I'm not sure if one or the other is more important. Seems like you can probably apply without test scores, but you can't apply grade optional, so I would focus on that. But a good test score can always help your application. What other problems do we want to do? I think we had mentioned trig before, is that right? Oh. Yeah, I see we got a submission here. That looks exactly like a SAT type problem. Let's do this one next. Yeah. Where did you get this uh, practice problem from? Was it like Khan Academy? Because this looks exactly like something you'd see on an SAT. Uh, Thunderly, I'm not sure what the question is. Number 42. Yeah, let's, let's draw this one out. So, JKL. In JKL, J is a right angle. We're trying to find JKL. Cosine of K is 24 over 51, so that's adjacent over hypotenuse. So let's let's look at this. If you know your so Katoa, what this tells you is your uh, side length ratios for different trig functions. So cosine, the one we're looking at here, relates the adjacent and the hypotenuse sides of a tr of a triangle. That means cosine of angle k. Looking from k, the perspective of angle k, the adjacent side would be 24, and the hypotenuse would be 51. So I've labeled those sides here. We also know that j is a right angle, so we can solve for jl. We can use Pythagorean theorem. So uh, let's, if we call this x, we could have x squared plus 24 squared equals 51 squared then that tells us that x is equal to the square root of 51 squared minus 24 squared. I think somebody's, yeah, we've got an answer in the chat already, meaning you've seen the square root of 51 squared minus 24 squared is 45. So when we're taking the value of cosine of L, cosine of L, now we're, we're changing perspectives. The new adjacent side is, is x, which is 45. And the hypotenuse is still 51. So cosine of L is equal to 45 over 51. So it's kind of like Sokotoa and right triangle rules. So I won't do that for number 42 question because I'm not familiar with, it's kind of outside the scope of the SAT. And also, I kind of don't know how I would do it. It might take me a while. OK. As long as it's the SAT question, let's do it. Let's do the hardest SAT question. Yeah, ellipses. Oh, ellipses. Yeah, I guess ellipses is a ACT problem. So maybe we could try it out.
So standard form of an ellipse, if I recall, is going to be something like uh, standard form of an ellipse is going to be something like similar to a circle, but Is this centered at zero? Let me see. Yeah, it looks like it's centered at zero, zero. So typical form of ellipse would be something like x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equals 1. So it's really similar to a circle. But now we've got these scale factors. Oh, let's do that one after. I'll paste that in. So vertices are at 0 and plus or minus 3. So if I sketch this out, I'll get a good sense of what we're looking at here. The focus points at 0 plus or minus 2 and the vertices at 0 plus or minus 3 so something like this these vertices are going to give us the value of our a value the the scale factor along the x direction. So the vertices are directly related to this a value, meaning if the, uh, oh sorry, I'm plotting this on the wrong axis. 0 is uh, on the x. So let's just redraw that and put the points correctly on the y-axis. Focus point 0 on the x, plus or minus 2 on the y, and vertices are plus or minus 3 on the y. So something like that. The vertices here should be directly related to the b value. If the vertices are plus or minus 3, then the b value is going to be 3. So b squared is equal to 9. The how do you say it? foci focus points are 0 plus or minus 2. So let's do it like so. The, uh, this gives us our C value. So we're going to calculate intermediate value here. No, that's, yeah, that's right. We can relate the A and B values from this equation to each other by using this intermediary value C, or I guess in this case C squared. And the way it's related is that C squared is equal to a squared minus b squared. So 4 is equal to a squared minus 9. So a squared should be equal to, did I do this right, 13? Yeah. You said it's more. Right now, the equation that I'm getting is uh, x squared over 13 plus y squared over 9 is equal to 1. Let's just plot that out in Desmos and make sure, because we could have made a simple mistake. y squared over uh, 9 equals 1. 
it does look like indeed it passes through 0, 3, 0, negative 3. And if we change some of those values, well, I don't know how to calculate those focus points, but uh, we'll go with this as our answer. I'm not sure where we're getting y squared over 21, but I'm getting y squared over 9 here. Right. Yeah. I'm not sure about the a squared value, but definitely should be y squared over 9 to allow it to pass through the vertices 0 plus or minus 3 if we're doing number 42 here. Let me put the Desmos plot in the solution as well. Oh, okay. Let's put that there. Okay, let's do a few more problems. I'll put this one here for later. Next one I want to do is this quadratic problem. It says a quadratic function models a projectile's height in meters above the ground in terms of the time in seconds after it was launched. So at the the model estimates the projectile was launched from an initial height of 7 meters above the ground and reached a maximum of 51.1 meters above the ground 3 seconds after the launch. How many seconds after the launch does the model estimate the projectile will re return to a height of 7 meters? Yeah, this one you can do some solving, but you it's really just trying to test your understanding of symmetry of parabolas. So if it starts at 7, it reaches its maximum height here. It's going to return to 7 after the same amount of time has passed. So 3 seconds to the top, and 3 more seconds to fall down to 7 meters. So it's going to be 6 seconds after launch. Yeah, yeah, you'd probably want to use a vertex form of the equation. So. Yeah. Um, let's do the other ones we have lined up. 26 is a pretty tough one. It says for each real number r, which of the following points lies on the graph of the equation? Yeah, I'll, I'll reply to it in the chat. Let's do this one. Graph of each equation in the xy plane for the given system. I kind of like to just approach this one by plugging stuff in. So, and actually first, what I always notice is that this bottom equation is just, or the, the yeah, the bottom equation here is just five times the top equation. So they're technically the same, same equation. But uh, we can plug in some points here is essentially what they're giving us here. And we can see if any of them work in these equations. So you could solve it for y equals. That's what I usually do. But let's try it just plugging stuff in. And we'll just plug it into one equation because both of these equations are technically the same. So you plug in something like choice. Let's try choice A. We get 2 times uh, r over 5 plus 7 plus 3 times negative r over 5 plus 35 equals 7. Is that true? Well, here I'm going to get 2r over 5 plus 14. And then I'm going to get minus 3r over 5 plus the 35 times 3 is 105. I mean, already I can see this is not going to be true. We still have this r term that never canceled out. So that's not really going to work. Let's try answer choice 
b, try plugging in answer choice b, we would get 2 times negative 3r over 2 plus 3 times, sorry, I also forgot to add the plus 7 over 2. And then we do plus 3 times r equals 7. So if we simplify that one, this would cancel out the, the 2 in a denominator here. We get negative 3r plus 7 plus 3r equals 7. Actually, that is true, because the negative 3r and positive 3r cancel, and we get a true statement that 7 equals 7. You can also try plugging in c and d, but you won't. You will find that plugging them in won't give you a good match. It'll just be kind of like the first one where it won't simplify down, where the r's will not cancel. So it's going to be answer choice b for that one. And let's do this hard SAT problem next. I think I might have done this one before. It's kind of tricky. But let's go through it, because it's, it's a little bit fun. Arc SBT is a one quarter of a circle with center R and radius 6. If the length plus the width of rectangle ABCR is 8, then the perimeter of the shaded region is blank. One thing I noticed right away is the radius is 6, right? So from here to here, it's going to be 6 across the diagonal of the rectangle. That means from A to C, it's also 6. Uh, either way you look at it, they're both 6, because that's a radius, that's also a diagonal. That means this is a same diagonal is length of 6. We also have, let's set up some equations here. So length plus width is 8. Uh, what else can I do here? I have the diagonals which I'm not sure if that helped me right now, but I'll save that information. Uh, we know that from uh, A to R plus R to C is 8. Let's set up a little, a few more labels here. So we can label S A as X, and we can label C to T as Y. And let me also just, for clarity, label that this bottom length is also a radius of 6. We can set up a little equation here that tells us the, oh, and also let's do, uh, what is the arc length SBT, arc length SBT. That's going to be one quarter of the circumference of a circle, 2 pi times 6. It has a radius of 6, so that's 3 pi. The total perimeter of the shaded region is going to be SA, which we labeled as x, plus y, plus the diagonal of 6 plus 3 pi. So we just need to figure out what this x plus y is equal to. And if the total length from s to r is 6 and a total length from r to t is 6, we can consider this as one whole system where uh, we have s to r plus r to t is just equivalent to 6 plus 6, but that's also equivalent to x plus the length plus the width plus y. So that tells us that 12 is equal to x plus length plus width plus y.
We also know length plus width is 8, so we get 12 equals x plus y plus 8, or x plus y equals to 4. So finally, substitute that in. And after evaluating all those pieces of information, it's a, I did a little bit kind of messy way, but we get 10 plus 3 pi, which is answer choice B. I'm pretty sure this is a SAT. This, I'm pretty sure this is an SAT problem because I feel like I solved this exact one in one of the paper tests. The discontinued paper tests. You can check. I still have them uploaded on my website somewhere in a blog post, but I don't know. It's like one of the last ones in the section. I think like section 4. We... I feel like it's got to be like SAT practice test 8 or something like that. No, it wasn't that. Maybe like 7. I'm not going to spend too much time looking at it. Or you know what? It was one of like the first it was like one of the first ones, like one through four. I don't know. If one of you guys can look through SAT paper tests one through four, you might find it. Uh, Miss Simon starts her drive at 6.30 a.m. She can drive at her average driving speed with no traffic delay for each segment of the drive. If she starts her drive at 7 a.m., no, we'll do. We'll finish this problem, and then we'll we'll call it a day. She starts her drive at 7 a.m. The travel time from the freeway entrance to the freeway exit increases by 33% due to slower traffic, but the travel time for each of the other two segments does not change. Based on table, how many more minutes? Uh, do you have the table that goes along with this? If not, I'll keep looking for the actual problem. Because I think that's potentially very necessary for us to solve this one. I was able to find the table. It's definitely from a actual practice test. I, I just couldn't find the original practice test, but I found this version of it. How many more minutes does Miss Simon take to arrive at her workplace if she starts at 7 a.m. than if she starts her drive at 6.30 a.m.? Well, the... Let's first figure out how many minutes it'll take if she starts at 6.30 a.m., kind of like the baseline. We can set up an equation using speed equals distance over time. So if we want to figure out the time, we just multiply or time is equal to distance divided by speed. So the time it takes across the different segments is going to be the distance divided by the speed. And what it says, it says in minutes. So I'll just keep track of the units here. So the base speed is 0 0.6. So we have the, the time is equal to 0 0.6 miles over 25 miles per hour. We have 15.4 miles over 50 miles per hour, we have 1.4 miles over 35 miles per hour. 
So in total, what do we get? 0.6 over 25, 15.4 over 50, we got 1.4 over 35. That's This number is in hours, so I'm just going to multiply by 60 to get minutes. It's 22.32 minutes. And then it says uh, the travel time from the freeway entrance to the freeway exit increases by 33% if, she's, if she leaves late. So in that case, it would still be that 0.6 over 25. Uh, we would we could still do 15.4 miles over 50 miles per hour, but I would just multiply this by a factor of 1.33 to account for that 33% increase in travel time. And the rest stays unchanged. And so we can also just do that in our calculator here. That's why I love Desmos. It looks like it's 28.42 minutes. So the difference, if we're rounding to the nearest minute, it looks like it increased by about uh, six minutes, plus six minutes. Yeah. We also could have just, we didn't, oh, we didn't need to calculate the whole Like uh, travel time, we could have just looked at the freeway portion and compared that, or yeah, the co compared that to the the case where that's 33% longer because that's the only thing that's really changing. But I thought it'd be nice to calculate the whole thing. Probably let's end it off there. Thank you guys. Was it uh, this question? All right, nice. Yeah, thank you guys for coming out. Don't forget, I post all these recordings, so you'll be able to watch this, and you can submit your questions to me every week here. All right, bye-bye.